Evolution, a deliberate yet subliminal process for all but humankind. We cannot wait. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. He's on the move. Coming right up, Manchester United is one of the world's most famous football clubs with a global following. It was the first soccer club to launch its own television station, MUTV, which will soon be available in over 80 countries. In 2001, the newest Aston Martin was making quite a stir. We take you on a tour of historic Wimbledon. And in 1783, two brothers flew across the roofs of Paris in a balloon. In 1934, balloon flight had become far more sophisticated due to this man, Professor Jean Picard, who developed the pyrotechnics that are deployed in space applications to this day. This man, his wife, and his brother were in every sense of the word trailblazers. People like you, who every day are contributing to and making history. But first, dyslexia, word blindness. It affects up to one in 10 children. It can hold them back at school, dent their confidence, and in some cases, blight their whole lives. A medical team in the north of England has found that the cause of dyslexia lies in part of the brain controlling balance. That's great. They've developed a treatment that is producing some dramatic results. The centre is based here in Kenilworth, a small town in the English Midlands. Steve Bundy has brought his son Adam along for a routine assessment. Adam has difficulty with reading and writing. That's typical of dyslexia. But like many of the other children who come here, he has other problems like poor concentration and difficulty organising his thoughts. Special tests uncover what is really going on in the brain of these dyslexic children. This posture control test shows not only how well Adam can balance, but exactly how he does it. Adam now ventures out on his scooter rather than playing computer games alone in his bedroom. The centre seems to have tapped a huge need. After one press article, the staff were taking a thousand calls a day from parents looking for help. It's the brainchild of businessman Winford Dorr, who was determined to do something for dyslexic children after seeing his own daughter suffer for years. The solution that has been found to the dyslexia problem is across several disciplines, and it involves the disciplines like sitting round a table, talking to each other and pulling together. Lauren Edwards had problems with her balance and couldn't ride a bike. She also has difficulty reading, something that often leads to dyslexic children being wrongly classified as unintelligent. Fear of stigmatization meant Lauren's school failed to acknowledge her dyslexia. Lauren's older brother, Alex, also had dyslexic symptoms. He says things have got a lot better in just a few weeks of doing these balance exercises. It would appear to be too much of a coincidence to suggest that Alex and his sister are just growing and learning new skills irrespective of the set exercises. To be sure that the exercise therapy pioneered at the center is really beneficial needs independent academic research. At Exeter University, Professor of Education David Reynolds has seen other treatments purporting to solve the problem. The field of dyslexia, he says, is prone to fads. Professor Reynolds is organising a clinical trial using large numbers of local school children to assess this therapy. 
The centre claims that out of more than 300 children seen so far, 97% have benefited from the therapy. Rachel Smith, the Director of Clinical Assessment, says that academically their grades have almost invariably improved. Why children develop dyslexia is not clear. Meanwhile, this centre is giving worried parents a practical and effective route out of the problem. At £158,000 apiece, craning the latest Aston Martin into the second story of the British Design Museum was a delicate operation, to say the least. Its extruded aluminium exterior is still spotless after this same car was used to launch the new model V12 Vanquish at the Geneva Motor Show in March 2001. The V12 Vanquish started life as a concept car shown at the Detroit Motor Show in 1998. The consumer response to the design so overwhelmed Aston Martin that it spent three years developing the car for production. Its six-litre V12 engine has a maximum speed of over 160 miles per hour and more than 450 horsepower. It accelerates to 60 miles per hour in less than 4.5 seconds, changing gear with Formula One style paddles. It boasts a number of world firsts in design and construction, including carbon fibre in the main body, offering Formula One crash protection. The inspiration for its look harks back to the 60s. The V12 Vanquish was sold out until the beginning of 2003. The mowers are out in force. The grass is cut crossways, lengthways and diagonally. They comb it, they put sand in it, they fertilise it. Wimbledon. What a wealth of history has been played out on its pampered grass courts. Half a million or so visitors flood through the gates as the best players in the world compete for the coveted Wimbledon trophies. For those not able to attend Wimbledon fortnight though, all is not lost. The club's museum has launched a guided tour that provides visitors with an authentic Wimbledon experience. The museum is one of the best collections in the world, ranging from antique clothes to modern day memorabilia like Anna Kornikova's dress. Boris Becker's battered shoes and Bjorn Borg's instantly recognizable tennis gear. Visitors linger over the original Challenge Cups and remember the many battles won and lost here. Now though, you can view the hallowed turf of Centre Court from the International Box or take a seat here. And in other prohibited areas like Number One Court, the BBC Studio, the Picnic Terrace and Water Gardens. But for now, the workmen and mowers are taking centre stage. Those who can't make the championships can at least get a feel for what is the most celebrated, the most coveted Grand Slam tournament and quintessentially English tennis tournament in the world. In 1783, two brothers named Montgolfier made the very first man flight five miles above the streets of Paris. In 1934, it was another famous pair of brothers who developed the forerunner of today's pressurized spacecraft, Auguste and Jean Picard. Years later, applying the same techniques, they constructed a gondola to be carried by a hydrogen balloon to the opposite extreme, the stratosphere. The Picard balloon flights led to the complete environmental systems without which spaceflight would not be possible. 
Pressurised cabins are of course necessary, as are the pressurised spacesuits worn by the astronauts for such times that the cabin is not pressurised and for EVAs. The Doctors Picard also pioneered the development of other inventions to make possible man's explorations high above ground. For example, pyrotechnic devices. These are explosive systems used for many purposes during spaceflight, separating launch stages and modules for spacecraft, cutting the lines of parachutes after they had served their purpose during re-entry, blowing open the adapter which protects the lunar module during launch and early flight. In the Apollo spacecraft, there were over 100 such pyrotechnic systems. Here, Professor Picard shows the pyrotechnic device for releasing ballast from a balloon gondola. The blasting cap is placed in the center of the bag, then filled up with sand. Then, from inside, with an electric contact, he explodes the blasting cap and the bag punctures very safely. That particular application was credited with saving the lives of Professor Picard and his wife, who went along with him on flights as official photographer. They are the only people who made the stratosphere flight in the 30s through clouds, landing again through clouds, and lived to tell the tale. The balloon was inflated with 700 cylinders of hydrogen. Just a little gas is needed. This is the difference between a stratosphere balloon and an ordinary balloon. A small amount of gas is put into the top of the balloon until it's about one-tenth full. Now the balloon is fully inflated. It's held by ropes until liftoff. Of the 300 volunteers that gathered to witness the event and help out, only six of them had ever seen a balloon before. When the famous balloonist Ed Hill signaled, all the men went forward a given amount so that the balloon went up evenly on all sides. At this stage, they began to be conscious of the stress on the balloon. The lower part was turned up inside and it was an ethereal sight that presented itself on the chilly morning. The stress on the balloon would have been too great if they'd taken off at this point. The material would tear in flight, so the appendix is opened, allowing air into it, and all the folds are made free and easy. The gondola is moved very carefully under the balloon and attached to the load ring, and the load ring is held by four heavy ropes. The white bags above the gondola holding the ropes to the balloon will be severed using lengths of TNT. This is the first pyrotechnic device used to release an aircraft. Professor Picard's two sons, Paul and Donald, are in the foreground. Takeoff is at 6.58 a.m. at Dearborn, Michigan. Professor Picard is inside and his wife is atop the gondola watching for the signal from Ed Hill to know when to cut the four ropes. They weigh off, taking out a little ballast until they're just light enough. Now the ropes angle a little to the side. The balloon is being blown by the wind and as they cut the ropes with the pyrotechnics, the gondola arcs back towards the crowd. Get under the balloon and push them up, comes the cry from the gondola. The top of the picture shows that the balloon is free of strain so that there's no stress on the material. The top of the gondola is painted white and the bottom black to control the temperature. The outside temperature is freezing while it's a comfortable 67 degrees Fahrenheit inside the gondola. The gondola is only one eighth of an inch thick aluminium alloy. They rise at 200 feet per minute. After they get above the clouds, 
the ambient pressure is so low that their onboard supply of oxygen begins boiling too rapidly. They close the doors to hermetically seal the gondola. The environmental control system, which they call air conditioning, consists of liquid oxygen for breathing, a barometer, thermometer, an electric fan to circulate the air, silica gel to keep it freshened, alkali to absorb carbon dioxide, and anhydrous magnesium perchloric to absorb moisture. The air is tested throughout for purity and it is found to be in very good condition. which is more than can be said for the wireless. This is the shoreline of Lake Erie. Clouds over the lake are higher than over the land. And here is the balloon at 35,000 feet. Looking up through the top of the gondola shows how the balloon breathes as the air forces its way in through the open appendix. There's no gas present at this time as the descent begins. So they land ostensibly as a hot air balloon. They bounce along over the top of the clouds below 10,000 feet. They listen. The hatch is open. Finally, they land in some trees after dropping 800 pounds of ballast. The balloon was punctured by the trees. Trailblazers. They call it the theater of dreams. Old Trafford Stadium on the outskirts of Manchester. For 90 years, the home of what has now become one of the world's richest football clubs. Sir Matt Busby was manager in 1968 when Manchester United became the first English club to take the European Cup. In those days, it was the likes of Bobby Charlton, George Best and Dennis Law that the crowds flocked to see here. Today, it's not only the faces on the red mugs and key rings sold in the stadium shop that have changed. Football is now big business, and in football, they don't come any bigger than Manchester United. This summer, the team went on a pre-season Far East tour. Adoring fans mobbed them when they arrived in Malaysia. The current England captain, David Beckham, was lucky to escape with his jacket. As well as playing matches against Malaysia, Thailand and Singapore, the team gave coaching lessons. Dutch international striker, Groot van Nistelrooy scored his first goal for Manchester United in the match against Malaysia. And Ruud van Nistelrooy has opened his account for Manchester United inside seven minutes of his debut in pre-season. Long plane journeys followed by training and playing in tropical heat may not be the player's favourite preparation for the home football season. But this is a service for the thousands of fans in the region who faithfully follow the fortunes of Manchester United. And for the other Manchester United fans who can't make the trip to England, the club has its own television service. Manchester United Television broadcasts six hours every evening from its studio inside the stadium. This season, for the first time, all the club's domestic league games are being shown. Former players Paul Parker and Clayton Blackmore help analyse United's rather lacklustre performance in September 2001 Champions League match against Lille. Discussion programs like these, often with current players on the panel, are a regular feature of the output. Viewers can phone into the studio with queries, comments and advice. For the younger fans, the daily children's show Reds at Five offers competitions, games, opportunities to meet the players and here hints on designing a greetings card with photos of your favourite player. Shop, right? It's really, really cheap. 
And here, I've used these little red hearts. That From its studio at United's look, training yeah, so centre, MUTV broadcasts a weekly show where players and coaches drop in to give expert analysis of the Reds' performance in their latest Premiership game. Exclusive interviews with the top players are a regular feature of the output. In a recent appearance, Norwegian international Ole Gunnar Solskjaer spoke about two foreign players signed up for United this season. Kroot van Nistelrooy is United's new Dutch striker, bought in April for £19 million. And United's midfield lineup gets a boost this season from Argentinian international Juan Sebastian Varon. Van Nistelrooy showed his hunger for goal scoring throughout the Asian tour. MUTV cameras gave viewers access to the action on the pitch and to the thoughts of players and managers off it. MUTV will be carrying all United's domestic league games, though rights to European games are yet to be negotiated. And the service will shortly be seen in 80 countries. It is Beckham, deflected. There is the cheer. And there is the smile from David Beckham. Not a trademark free kick. He needed the help of a deflection, but he scored for the second successive match on tour. Manchester bookshops rarely see cues like this, but when George Best makes an appearance, the fans still come flocking. The Manchester United star of the 1960s, now recovering from alcoholism, was signing copies of his autobiography. The adulation is an indication of the lingering star appeal of those who have made their name at Old Trafford. The 60 staff that run the station are mostly young and fired by an inexhaustible enthusiasm for everything associated with the Reds. But it's not all glamorous foreign trips and exciting goal action for the MUTV film crews. A constant part of their work is following today's players around Greater Manchester when they're called upon to open hotels and perform other civic duties. With other top clubs like AC Milan and Real Madrid already following suit, it looks like Manchester United's idea of club TV is about to take off throughout Europe.